On the 11th of July 1921, a ceasefire was formally signed between members of the Dáil Cabinet and the British military commander in Ireland. This was the first step towards securing and maintaining the rights and liberties common to the whole people of Ireland since the formation of the Irish Volunteers in October 1913 and the armed insurrection during the Easter week in 1916. On the 6th of December, Arthur Griffith and Michael Collins signed the Anglo-Irish Treaty in London, which provided for the establishment of the Irish Free State as a self-governing dominion within the British Commonwealth of Nations. On January 7, 1922, Dáil Éireann voted 64 in favour and 57 against. In the aftermath of the treaty vote, Eamon de Valera resigned his post specifically over the required oath of allegiance to the Crown and his supporters boycotted the Dáil, dividing the Irish government into opposing sides. As the Anglo-Irish Treaty gained momentum, talks of civil war began to emerge. On the 14th of April, the four courts were occupied and became the headquarters of Republican forces led by Rory O'Connor, who opposed the Anglo-Irish Treaty. According to the book Michael Collins by Tim Pat Coogan, in the hope for uniting pro and anti-treaty forces, Michael Collins selected seven men to form a group called the Constitution Committee to produce a constitution for the Irish Free State which would be both acceptable to the British and Republicans and enough to prevent civil war. In the first meeting on the 25th of January at the Shelbourne Hotel in Dublin, Michael Collins as chairman instructed the committee to create a true democratic constitution. It was to contain not the legalities of the past, but the practicalities of the future. It was to be short, simple and easy to alter as the final stages of complete freedom were achieved, and that there should be no suggestion in the constitution that any power in Ireland derived from the Crown. Therefore the oath should be left out. The new constitution must be one which would guarantee Ireland's equality of status not only within the British Empire but amongst all the nations of the world. Michael Collins was held ultimately responsible for the drafting of the constitution and due to his other commitments he allowed the secretary of the committee Daryl Edmund Vickers to act in his stead. The utmost task for the constitution makers was to prescribe a permanent independent structure to represent, protect and reflect the desires of each Irish citizen. Daryl Vickers a prominent Irish writer and activist worked collectively with the committee on the philosophy of Ireland's ancient Gaelic state as well as creating a clause to peacefully retain and cater for these changes through a modern mechanism called the Citizens' Initiative which was gracefully inspired by the unshackled constitution of Switzerland and the people who then had at least up to 90 years of solid continuous practice behind them. Also known as direct democracy was contained in articles 47 and 48 and drafted into the constitution of the Irish Free State. In Switzerland, every year on the first Sunday in May, voters of Canton Claris gather for their citizens' assembly. For the last 700 years, the assembly has decided in open air and in a true democratic fashion on their constitution, the legislation and taxes, as well as important day-to-day -day issues. Everyone with the right to vote is entitled not only to make a statement on any issue, but also to propose an amendment. As a result, the Citizens' Assembly in Canton Claris often acts as a trendsetter. In this way, the eligible voting age was lowered to 16 and the former 25 villages were promptly merged into three core municipalities. Each motion made by its citizens passes through various stages of authorization until it reaches the Citizens' Assembly, where it is discussed and voted upon. After 27 meetings, three drafts were made and submitted to the Provisional Government on the 7th of March. Overall, they were an accurate representation of Collins' original aspirations. All were short, uncomplicated and general rather than too detailed and avoided references to British authority. Running as an independent candidate during the general elections, Darl Figgis said during his speeches that a government will be formed in June and that the people will be making a choice between war and peace, order and anarchy between the development of a state and nation and the return to futile struggle. On the 4th of May, the leaders of the pro and anti-treaty forces met to discuss an agreement. A truce was declared with the view to allowing the Dáil Committee to bring their work and the constitution to completion. On the 20th of May, Eamon de Valera and Michael Collins worked out a pact and agreed that the pro and anti-treaty factions 
would fight the general election jointly and form a coalition government afterwards. Draft B, the work of Hugh Kennedy, James Douglas and Clement France was eventually chosen and brought to London to be presented to the British authorities by Michael Collins. At first sight, the draft constitution struck Winston Churchill and Lloyd George as a complete evasion and complete negation of the treaty. Lloyd George said it was substantially a setting up of an independent republic in Ireland. The crown was only brought in under conditions very derogatory to its dignity. The court, which constitutes the empire, was expressly excluded. The British Empire was ruled out from the makings of the treaties altogether. The constitution was a complete going back on the provisions of the treaty. On the 31st of May, Winston Churchill sent a statement to Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson saying, I have been asked by honourable members who are in agreement with the honourable and gallant member for North Down, Sir Henry Wilson, whether we will tolerate the setting up of a republic. I have been asked to give an assurance on that point. I have said no, we will not do so. In the event of the setting up of a republic, it will be the intention of the government to hold Dublin as one of the preliminary and essential steps in military operations. Sir Henry Wilson replied, Now we know that the troops in Dublin are being kept in Dublin in order to go to war with the Republic if a Republic be established. Sadly, whatever slight hope of avoiding the Irish Civil War had evaporated, and the constitution on which Collins had pinned such hopes ended up being so altered as to bring it back into conformity with the treaty. On the 12th of June, he went immediately to London to try and change Churchill's mind. Afterwards, in despair, he travelled straight to Cork for solace. The next day, Dublin newspapers reported an assault on Daryl Figgis and his wife. The Evening Herald said that shortly before midnight, Millie Figgis had answered a knock at the door. Three men rushed past her, seeking out her husband. Mrs Figgis, fearing they had come to shoot her troublesome husband, attempted to block their way and was roughly treated by the gang, who then smashed down the door to the study held down Mr. Figgis and cut off one half of his beard. On the morning of polling day, the Irish independent newspapers carried a small book titled The Irish Constitution Explained, written during the formation of the Constitution by Darl Figgis and detailing the noble aspects of the committee's vision and constructive thought for the future, focusing on its readers who hoped it would be one of independence, democracy and peace. On the 16th, Darrell Figgis was elected as an independent member of parliament for the Dublin County constituency. In his book, The Irish Constitution Explained, he had wrote, The presence, therefore, in our constitution of both the referendum and the initiative is therefore a sign that the people of Ireland are to be rulers in their own house, not merely as against foreign control, but as against the dominance of political parties. It means more. It means that the responsibility is now definitely reposed in them, There are provisions which, in the present draft of the Constitution, could with advantage be changed. For to require in Article 47 that a petition from the people of not less than one twentieth of the voters then on the register is necessary and the alternative of a vote of three-fifths of the Senate before a measure can be put to the referendum is to impose an almost impractical and certainly an extremely difficult task. It reveals a fear of the exercise of the referendum that experience in other countries does not justify. With the wide franchise allowed in the constitution, the tendency would be to play into the hands of political parties, and one of the purposes of the referendum is to destroy the power of political parties. Yet a slight change here may easily be made, and the essential fact is that the people of Ireland, having asserted the fact of their sovereignty and defined its qualities, proceed to exercise its functions by holding over the Eructus the two instruments of the referendum and the initiative. How will those functions be exercised It is impossible to say, except that there is no education like the education of responsibility. With the referendum in their hands, especially with the initiative added to it, the will of the people is always present. The people can hasten legislation where it moves slowly. They can retard it where it presses too fast ahead. They themselves can make the pace. And the effect on themselves is that, 
with this added responsibility, they take a quick interest in their own concerns. In the first place, they break up the power of political organizations, and in the second place, they themselves become alert and educated citizens, responsible and intelligent guiders of their own destinies. On the 22nd of June, Henry Wilson was assassinated and the Provisional Government General Ginger O'Connell was kidnapped four days later. As a direct result of the political assassination, Winston Churchill sent Michael Collins a letter stating, The presence in Dublin of a band of men styling themselves the headquarters of the Republican executive is a gross breach and defiance of the treaty. The time has come when it is not unfair, premature or impatient for us to make to the strengthened Irish government and the new Irish parliament a request in express terms that this sort of thing must come to an end. If it does not come to an end, if through weakness, want of courage, or some other less creditable reason it is not brought to an end, and a speedy end, then it is my duty to say, on behalf of His Majesty's Government, that we shall regard the treaty as having been formally violated, and we shall take no steps to carry out or legalise its further stages, and that we shall resume full liberty of action in any direction that may seem proper, or to any extent that may be necessary to safeguard the interests and the rights that are entrusted to our care. Collins's response was corrosive, but he was only too well aware that the British attacking the four courts were growing by the hour, which could escalate to a point where the provisional government troops might end up fighting alongside the British. Despite his anger against Churchill, Collins acted against his old comrades, and on the 28th of June, civil war broke out across Ireland. After two days, Dublin's largest public records office known to have kept priceless manuscripts dating back to the famine and the 12th century, situated within the four courts, had been destroyed. On the 12th of August, Arthur Griffith died. The cause of death was reported as being due to heart failure. He was buried in Glasnevin Cemetery in Dublin. Ten days later, on the 22nd of August, Michael Collins was assassinated on his journey to Cork City. He was buried in Glasnevin Cemetery. The civil war was raging and a form of martial law prevailed. The reaction of the four courts to the habeas corpus applications brought during the civil war demonstrated that the judges were either unwilling or unable to provide effective protection of the fundamental rights of the population. The opponents of the Anglo-Irish Treaty also opposed the new Shannadaran, and 37 of the senators' homes were burnt to the ground. Others were intimidated, kidnapped or nearly assassinated. The Irish Free State, as contemplated by the Treaty, came into existence when its constitution became law on the 6th of December. On the 24th of May 1923, Eamon de Valera issued a statement telling the Republican army to stand down and that the time for fighting with guns was over and that the political process is the best route towards change. An estimation of 3,000 people had been killed and 12,000 were taken as prisoner during the civil war in Ireland. On the 18th of November 1924, Vigus's wife Millie committed suicide using a Webley revolver previously given to her by Collins following the 1922 assault. A letter was found referring to her injuries and depression brought on as a result of the attack. Millie was buried at Mount Jerome Cemetery in Dublin. In 1925, Figgis himself had taken his own life, one week after the death of his new love, Rita North, before they could be married. 
Rita died following an abortion in London and was brought back to Ireland where she was buried at Glasnevin Cemetery. A small group of mourners, comprising of close family and friends, attended his internment. No state funeral was given. The man who had done so much for the new state was then written out of its official history and his exploits and the great events that shaped the nation had almost been entirely forgotten. For almost 80 years the location of his grave was lost, but had been rediscovered in May of 2008 under several inches of soil at West Hampstead Cemetery in London. On the 3rd of May 1928, Eamon de Valera announced a petition and gathered over 96,000 signatures and presented it to the Dáil on the 16th of May, prepared in accordance with Article 48 of the Irish Free State Constitution. As the initiative technically required a referendum of its own to enforce its implementation, de Valera referred to it in his specific plan to initiate the removal of the oath. His plan immediately hit the rocks since his arch-rival Prime Minister William T. Cosgrave, who succeeded Michael Collins as chairman of the provisional government after he was killed, had already indicated his intention to get rid of the referendum and initiative articles by ordinary legislation before they could be used. On the 12th of July, the government passed the Constitutional Amendment Bill No. 10, which was designed to abolish Articles 47 and 48 even by using the device in Article 47 itself, which allowed for the waiving of delaying tactics if an act was necessary for the preservation of public safety, despite the large national protests of citizens in favour of direct democracy. The Free State Senate was also abolished entirely in 1936 after it delayed certain government proposals for constitutional changes. It opposed its own abolition, but this decision was overwritten by the Dáil. De Valera later created a new Senate in the new 1937 Constitution of Ireland. During the drafting of the second constitution, Eamon de Valera's third son Brian was killed in a horse riding accident on February 9, 1936. On the 29th of December 1937, the second constitution of the state came into force replacing the 1922 constitution that omitted direct democracy, which then established a system of representative democracy following a national plebiscite held on the 1st of July 1937. On the 21st of December 1948, the Eructus signed the Republic of Ireland Bill No. 22. By doing so, the Act abolished the last remaining functions of the King in relation to the Irish state, and on Easter Monday, the 18th of April 1949, Ireland was officially declared as a republic. Eamon de Valera died on the 29th of August 1975. He was buried in Glasnevin Cemetery. Nothing great comes easy. It always, whether it's a great meal, learning how to play the violin great, or whatever thing, anything you do that you're great at takes a lot of hard work. And it's going to take a lot of hard work to figure out how to break through the political system that exists now and put direct democracy into play.